Hi everybody, this is David Ellison from Megadeth and you are listening and watching Linear Rock. Hello, Mr. David Ellison from Megadeth. Welcome to Milano, welcome to Linear Rock. Ciao, how are you? Thank you. <laughs> Great to have you here. Uh, you. It's a special occasion you're actually I cannot say playing tonight but sort of sort of yes <laughs> yeah playing and storytelling okay a bit so of you're both. here yeah. in Milan for a very special event this is March 19 2019 and you're playing Legend Club in Milano for Bass Story which is a night where you combine music or should I say bass yeah. um, with storytelling yes uh, it's a kind of Uh, audio biography mm -hmm. uh, that you write, we can say, uh, upon fans' requests, a sort of compendium uh, to your book, My Life with Death and the Metal Bass DVD. What do you think? I think you said it perfectly. That is <laughs> exactly you. what it is. I, I love that, that it's a, it's a sort of audio... <laughs> Uh, to my life and to my career. And visual as well, and since visual, you're in yes. the presence. So. Well, you know, it started with, um, you know, I've done a lot of these base clinics. Um, people don't do them so much anymore. They were usually sponsored by music, equi like a guitar company or an yeah. amplifier company, and they really, they don't do so much of that anymore. So I, you know, created my own little method of doing it, um, which I think is very interactive with the fans. Yeah. Um, and a way that uh, brings them into uh, the story of my life, because quite honestly, they are a part of the story of my life. So I think that it's good that it's, it's sort of a family affair between me and the fans and also the music. Yeah. Where, where the idea comes from? I mean, it's just a matter, you know, of um, having sometimes doing something. Meanwhile, you know, Megadeth are... Right. Uh, having a break? Or... Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, you know, we've been working on a writing and, and uh, writing a new album and uh, beginning to record that. Uh, we learned with Dystopia to take our time, make sure that it's great. Uh, we're not in a hurry. Okay. Um, I think we've, we've come to this point with Megadeth Career that, um, <clears throat> you know, fans now want to always hear or see Megadeth. Um, and sometimes it's classic things like the, you know, anniversary of Rust in Peace or... Um, you know, they, the re-release of Killing Is My Business. There's all these celebrations. We yeah. have the new greatest hits, the Warheads uh, on sure. Foreheads. We've got the Ozzy Tour with Ozzy and Megadeth in the U.S. We've got Rock and Rio. We have the Mega Cruise. There's all these big things going on that are more than just what we used to have to do, which is make a new album, go on tour. That was kind of all there was. Now there's all these other interactive very VIP special events that are really engaging with the fans. And, um, you know, quite honestly, Bass Story is kind of my little piece of that as well that I can do when Megadeth is taking some time off from touring. And it's a great way to come and see the fans and, and be part of that. What kind of experience is this for you? I mean, is therapeutic in a sense? Because... You are in direct contact with the mm -hmm. people, which is something that you don't do very often. It, it is. And I think to do it myself, um, you know, like when we do as a band, we do these VIP uh, things. It's usually a hello, a photo, move on. Um, they can be kind of expensive. Um, but, I mean, you are, I think it's a good value because you're getting the whole band. <laughs> um, but for this, you know, for me... Um, you know, I've learned very early on, you know, you're wearing a Kiss t-shirt, yes. you know, and I, I grew up a big Kiss fan. And, you know, for me, uh, Kiss was a band that was untouchable. They were so big. They were a fantasy, you yeah. know. And so, I think in our genre, yes, sure. come over here. There you go. There, there you go. go. There it yes. is. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> the ultimate cool bass player right there, yeah. by the way, Gene Simmons. Um, but I think then when our generation started with thrash metal, Um, we were very much, it came kind of more from punk, you know, punk rock roots where like the fans, it almost looked like a fans getting on stage playing, yeah. uh, which is what we are. We're fans. We started bands, we started playing. And even though we've risen to this, you know, very sort of, you know, stardom celebrity kind of place, you know, the reality of it is in our hearts, yeah. 
were still just those kids who played music. And, and I think Bass Story really brings that back down to the real street level where, where it all started from. Are you learning something more about yourself through the fans' questions? Maybe remembering things that you didn't actually remember? Or... Yeah, the, the fan, <laughs> that's why I love to do a QA and a because the fans have the best questions, you know. Okay. And it's, and it's, I tell you, that's a, a really good point you bring up. Uh, for me to really be in touch with hearing from them what they really want, you know. I think I'm probably the one guy... Um, Uh, through the band over the years who, you know, I pay attention to what they say. In fact, lots of times I'll talk with Dave and I'll say, hey, fans are requesting this. You know, yeah. I see the fans are asking for that. And and I think a big part of it um, with Megadeth.com, which we've had since the uh, late 1990s, um, <clears throat> has been very interactive with the fans. And we have message boards and we have things where we read those comments. We pay attention. You know, like one or two fans that say, Hey, I want to hear track seven, side B, album three. <laughs> you know, we can't do everything specifically for every fan, but, um, you know, we pay attention. Uh, conversely, with Bass Story, you know, the other night I was in Romania and Bucharest, and fans, a fan asked, he said, Hey, can I hear In My Darkest Hour? And that's not part of my repertoire. Um, but, but I keep my my repertoire pretty loose. So when a sure. fan says, "Hey, can you play that?" I, I was like, "Is that okay that I play this song?" And everybody's like, "Yeah." You know, that's part of the game in a night like that. It, it so. is. It <laughs> is, and I love it. It's so cool. I love it, and and I stay up on the parts. I mean, um, <clears throat> I remember most of the songs pretty well. You know, <laughs> and um, it's fun to do. Uh, talk about them there's all you know to me there's a story behind every song mm -hmm. and there's and that is the what bass story is is it is is isn't just me playing the part because you can go to youtube or okay. buy a ticket to a megadeth concert and you can see that um to me it's the story behind the song that really fans get to have a real they can really touch that when they come to bass story um About Megadeth Greatest Hits, mm. which you quite anticipated, um, Warheads on Foreheads is about to come out right. on March 22nd. Mm -hmm. um, actually, same day as Motley Crue, The Dirt Movie, but that's another story. No, it's actually it's a, it's a great story. You know, Nikki and I are friends. We've we'd be, we we had a brief um, run-in, ironically, the night he died um, mm -hmm. back in Hollywood. Uh, and in a, in a hotel room, I was yeah. hanging out with uh, Stephen Hadler from Guns N' Roses and Fred Curry from Cinderella was there. And and um, so it was there. the night that, yeah, it was unfortunate. Uh, but obviously, Nikki lived to tell about it and wrote his heroin diaries and yeah. wrote his story. <laughs> and I've written uh, a, a couple books. In fact, I've literally just finished uh, the final, final edits of my new book, More Life with Death, which... Okay. Um, Uh, I talk some about my own path, my own journey through the sex, drugs, and rock and roll of Hollywood and all that stuff. And, um, you know, we were just on tour with Slash, and he and I, you know, have been remained dear friends from our old days in Hollywood, both as, as musicians as well as, you know, just kind of the, the fun of Hollywood and everything. But so there's a lot of us that we, it's funny, Guns N' Roses, Motley Crue, and Megadeth, we were like the three bands, three separate genres. But our lifestyle was all very explosive, very, you know, punk rock. And, you know, uh, we had our own journeys and once in a while our paths would cross. And, you know, seeing the, the, the dirt, the movie come out is... Same day. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, I think it's great. I think it's, it's, you know, again, you know, there's with Motley Crue essentially, I guess, retiring as a touring band. And certainly Kiss is getting ready to, yeah. you know, wind down. Our friends in Slayer are, are deciding to... To wind it down, <clears throat> you know, you realize we're we're all still pretty young. Um, we're you know, there's life left in us, but yet you know, these legacies start to when they stop. And all we have is just the memory of it, you know. So I think that that the uh, you know with what they're doing, what Nikki's doing with that movie is is fantastic. I want to go see it. I mean, I went and saw Bohemian Rhapsody twice. I want to see it again. That I'd... will go just on Netflix, but so yes. you can see. It. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Whatever, exactly. Wherever It'll you are. So, yep. So, so who knows? Yeah, it's 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 cool. We will be back to the greatest hits. But you mentioned the, the new book, which mm -hmm. is. Do you think you're gonna have some new chapters? You know, after this base story tour that you're doing, maybe. <sighs> You know, yeah. remembering new stuff and adding, you know. Some I think the hardest th part about writing a book is that, you know, you sort of pick a starting point. Um, and at some point, you have to have an end. 
And it's funny because yeah. I, I picked an ending really from, you know, 2018. And now here we are, March, almost April of 2020. Mm-hmm. I mean, sorry, 2019, 19. rather, rather. <laughs> um, and a lot has happened just since then, yeah. you know. But you have to pick a point because the book is, my book's going to come out. The English translation will be out in uh, July. Um, and we've got some cool, another release coming out around it. The Ellison family history is going to be available as a download as mm-hmm. part of that. So there's all these pieces. And it, but at some point, I think the hardest part of writing a book is even when I read it, I'm like, oh my God, this is the end. They're like, there's so much that's happened since then. And, you know, that's why I think these books um, are cool and they're fun because they're a, 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 a point in time. Yeah. But man, life keep, you know, I would say life is a verb. You know, it's not a noun, it's a verb. So uh-huh. it's always in motion. It's an action. Yeah. So it's always going. And and I think that, um, you know, to some degree, that's why certainly what, what we can capture on Facebook Live and Instagram and all these things are immediate. Like they're like today, you yeah. know, while we're in Milano, bang, we can yeah. catch up on it. Right. So it's almost like the the printed word of the book is becoming a little, it's almost a little passe, I hate to say it. It's because because you can journal your life, you know, as you go now with yeah. social media, which I, I like. I think it's very cool, actually. So back to the greatest hits. Yep. So it's a triple CD, four discs on vinyl, <clears throat> uh, 35 years, 35 remastered songs in chronological order. Mm-hmm. Um, and it features also a comic book mm-hmm. uh, with it, telling stories inspired by the songs. Um, the whole band actually worked as a team on this huge project. How did you pick the songs? Well, d- you know, Dave, you know, I picked, we default to Dave, you know, to pick the songs. Um, and, you know, we've had several, uh, you know, greatest hits. So it's part of it is you don't want to just repeat that. Um, and, you know, we, we were kind of trying to find the right time to put this out because really the 35 years of Megadeth, we launched it back in uh, January of 2018, and that's when we started to celebrate right. every, uh, you know, an album every month. You know, the really the 35 years when Dave and I started, when Megadeth began, was really June of 1983. Yeah. So it really kind of legally can go till about June of, of, <laughs> of 2019, you know, which is why, you know, I think turning the corner into the new year to put this out, especially as we've got some big um, live concert plans coming out. I know everybody's anxiously awaiting a new album, but, you know, again, like I said, new albums, they, they take time, you know, they just, and it's going to take what it's going to take. And, you know, making an album, You know, man, they're, they, they just, they, they take time. There's a lot of work, obviously, yeah. putting, writing it, then the production of it, you know, and, and write, kind of like writing a book <laughs> is, is, you know, you sort of, you record it and then you keep coming back to it and you keep fixing it and tweaking it and perfecting it. And then there comes this moment when you go, okay, it's done. It's, it's done. Close it up, get it out the door and let's stop messing yeah. with it you know what i mean and albums are you know are very much like that that um you know at some point it's like making a great pasta i guess or a nice italian <laughs> dish at some point you have to serve it yeah to the to the hungry mouths that are right. wanting to be fed you know uh, otherwise it's gonna turn cold <laughs> exactly <laughs> and then the noodles aren't al dente and then you've got problems yeah but um, i'm sure that of the greatest hits you saw the list of course of course of the songs yeah, yeah no 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 we're very aware greatest. of course yeah okay yeah, yeah. but uh, do you think it's compiled actually with the youngest or with the older fans in mind Because you had, you know, before you know, that's, that's, a, album. that's a great question, because on Bass Story that I did in Florida back in December, there was this young guy in front mm-hmm. of me. And I finally said, what, what's your name? How old are you? He's 14. Wow. And I said, what is your favorite album? He goes, Peace Sells But Who's Buying. I mean, he was not only not even born, <laughs> yeah. who knows if his parents even were met <laughs> when right. Peace Sells came out, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, the uh, I think... I have a mantra, and that is our best path forward is revisiting our past, mm. you know? And we're very lucky to have that with Megadeth because that's not the case. There's a lot of bands that came up in the 80s, for instance, where what they did in the 80s, it, it almost became a joke and a laughing stock because, you know, the hairstyles and the fashion. And, yeah. you know, it, it really, it was a period piece, right? And you look back, oh, my God, can you believe we used to wear that? Can you believe, you know? That's not the case with Megadeth. You know, we've been very, I think, consistent 
you know, through the sound, the look, the feel, the intention, the integrity of what the band started as, carrying that mission all the way through. Um, and yeah, I mean, look, we've experimented with some things, of course. And for a period, I cut my hair short, you know, mm-hmm. but oh well, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, I had to start over with my hair, you know. But uh, but 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 the um, the truth of it is, is there's a consistency of Megadeth that really runs through our whole career. So, okay. so- <clears throat> when we go back, you know, I'm, I'm a Again, a KISS fan. And I, I reference Kiss Destroyer. That's my KISS. That's when I started with them. That was because that was the album when I was to, to 11. 76. Yeah, 11, yeah. To, you know, 12 years, almost 12 years old. That, I, that that was the new album. It was my, when I started to buy records, it was yeah. there. I bought it. That's when I came in. A fan wrote me one time and said, you know, why do you guys, uh, you sometimes kind of talk bad about this album Risk that mm. you made? And, and I think it was a woman, and she said, she goes, you know, I was 13, and that was the first album I bought. And I fell in love with it, and then I went and I bought every one of your other records, and I really became a true Megadeth fan. She, and she pointed out, she was kind of almost scolding me, like, remember that, you know, that's the album that made me fall in love with Megadeth. And, you know, kind of like, don't disrespect your own work. And it was wow. like a little bit of a scolding. Wow. And I was like, wow, <laughs> I, I paid attention to that. And, and um you know, it's and she she's right. I mean, that was just her age, um, and you know, you don't get to choose your age, and you don't get to choose culture that's around you. Right. So when people come into the Megadeth legacy, the thirty five years of it, whatever that is, um, whether it was dystopia or it was killing is my business or anything in between, you know, it's valid of when they came into it and what it says and reflects about their life. Okay. Um, so as you mentioned, you are working on the new album, mm-hmm. and Dave Mustaine also said that it's going to be very heavy. Mm-hmm. Um, but since you've done the greatest hits, you've done the remasters, so it's a revival <clears throat> period for the band. Do yeah. you think that it, it, this is going to influence, in a sense, with your past, that the new album uh, you know, will have such yeah. you know, revival feeling right. in it? <clears throat> well, I think one of the things that the 35-year campaign has done is it's uh, gotten all of us, and of course me and Dave being there at the beginning, yeah. and then certainly Dirk and Kiko having a different reference right. to Megadeth. You know, Kiko, he reminds us that, you know, he saw us play in 1991 at Rock and Rio, um, and that was his first real introduction to Megadeth. Yeah. And that was, you know, Rust in Peace, it's album four. That was quite a ways into our career at that point. Um, Dirk, being even younger, um, but being a drummer, being a student of the Megadeth catalog, he goes back and really references a lot of the early Garth Samuelson stuff from Killing Is My Business and Peace Cells. And he really kind of gets inside yeah. the mindset of, of a player like Gar. <clears throat> so it's nice that we have band members um, that, while not the original guys, they really bring kind of a point of reference to me and Dave of the things that were exciting to the fans uh, at the time when they discovered right. Megadeth. And so um, as we move forward now, you know, Dirk and Kiko can play anything. I mean, they're just incredible musicians. So, you know, to have Dirk go back into the earliest Megadeth, yet here he is a, an inventor, basically, of the grindcore drumming. Um to marry those two worlds together is yeah. is exciting, <clears throat> and, is. Sa- and same for Kiko. I mean, Kiko's a guy who you know he says he goes you know some of these Marty Freeman solos are very very difficult to replicate um, because of Marty's style. He goes he talks about Chris Poland. You know he says yeah. man it's like playing the Jan Hammer uh, who is the uh, keyboard player with Jeff Beck and of course wrote the Miami Vice soundtrack, but was a keyboard player who almost played like a guitar yeah. because he would bend notes. Mm-hmm. So so Kiko, again, being a schooled musician, a jazz musician as well, can go back and really get inside of of the the nuances of of the of the past Megadeth, yet he's also a super contemporary uh, international musician. And so we've got, so it's really kind of a nice uh, thing that we have where the influences and the references that we can bring into this, to this next Megadeth record. So look, yeah, I agree with Dave. It's definitely heavy. I mean, the stuff we we're working on is heavy and, and fans always want to hear that. Oh, it's heavy. It's heavy. It's heavy. (laughs) Yeah. Trust me. It's not going to be a lightweight album at all. all. You know, so Dave's right about that. At the same time, 
in adding to what Dave said, there's, there's again, the first record we're going to really hear of the four of us um, having been on tour yeah. and working together as a band now going into the studio uh, versus putting a band together, okay. you know, without having any road it's experience. Yeah, yeah, so I is. think there's a lot, of, a lot of really cool experiences that the four of us draw on to bring together for this new album now. You are a committed Christian, um, but let's say extreme metal music has not always been very religious friendly. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's say. Yeah. Okay, so during your career, did you ever have any problems maybe with your family or with yourself? Like, you know, a time of crisis <clears throat> saying, am I doing the right thing? Yeah. Am I against the commitments with what I do? Did yeah, you have... I mean, I, was, I grew up Protestant. I'm, you know, Norwegian. German, English, Danish yeah. is my heritage. So basically Northern European Protestants. Um, and uh, the little town I grew up in, it's a little farming town of about 3,000 people. And I think there's 14 churches, 11 of them are Lutheran. <laughs> there's one Catholic church. Um, and, you know, so I just grew up, it was, it was really nothing. I mean, you know, you work six days a week on the farm and then Sunday you go to church. I mean, it's just that simple. You know, I think there's this sort of big evangelical movement, especially in America, where they have these sort of big radical born again conversions. That is not my story. Okay. That is not my story. Um, and I, I, my sort of recommitment back to a, a faith journey, uh, which is exploratory as much as anything. Um, and that started when I got sobered up off drugs and alcohol back in 1990. And that, quite honestly, came through uh, that journey. Um, it wasn't, you know, a radical, you know, church thing that happened. And, and okay. you know, like I'm married, I take my kids to church. We do, we do all of that, you know. So, um, and it's great to, you know, raise a family, I think, un under that. I kind of, you know, we kind of mimic our parents a little bit, you know. We can be wild and crazy and do whatever we want. And then suddenly when we have children and we're raising a family, it's sort of a wake-up call to yeah. like, whoa, okay, <laughs> now what's the benchmark, you know? Is it is it Black Sabbath lyrics? Is it Iron Maiden lyrics? Or is it church? Maybe it's a little bit of all of it. Who knows, you know? So, um, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm able to, I, I look at it like this, you know, the good Lord gave me the talent to, to, to play, perform, sit here and have this discussion. Okay. Like, just take that out and just do that every day and leave the results up to the creator. All right. Uh, in 2015, you founded your own label, mm -hmm. EMP, yeah. Label Group. Uh, what pushed you uh, to this, you know, new project and commitment and which is your goal with it? And, in, and of which album of the ones that you already released you're more proud of? Well, it started when I I saw this little female teenage girl group play at my son's high school. They had like okay. a talent show and they played. Their name is Dollskin. And they, and they just, I was shocked. I was like, wow, this is like really good. You know, they met at a school of rock, which is a pretty big uh, organization okay. over in the United States. And... Um, and so I just stayed in touch with them. I took them to the studio. I produced some tracks. I wanted to put an, put their album out. And um, and um, I initially put that out through Megaforce. And then I realized they really needed to kind of like a, you know, to really, I, I had, I, that was just the beginning, you know. People think, oh, you put an album out, you're a rock star. And it's like, Phew. that's that's just the beginning yeah. of the path. And so then I formed EMP Label Group, got distribution, my, you know, I have a partner, Tom, who, who essentially runs most of the label operations for me. Um, and uh, from there, we started, you know, put out couple, another Dollskin record, but we also started to sign some other groups. Um, and some of my friends, Doyle, Mark Slaughter, the guys in Autograph, you know, there's some great records, you know, kind of deemed classic rock yeah. now. But, you know, these guys not only have been great artists in the beginning of their career, but kind of like Megadeth, they're still making really great music and touring. And man, anybody who is able to be in this business this long, and as long as, you know, my friends have been doing it, um, you know, God bless them. I mean, Doyle's kind of the same thing, plays in the Misfits, but he yeah. goes out and he does a solo career. I mean, you know, that's, it's a lot of work, man. I mean, it's, people see the hour on stage and it's, you know, that's it. Look, it's our job to make it all look fun and easy and <laughs> awesome. But uh, as on the other side of it, as a label, you know, you realize, you know, how much work they're putting into it. And then, look, if I can help support them and lift them up and help keep yeah. their career going, then you know what? It's the honor is, is all mine. 
Um, did you have any problems since EMP is also the <clears throat> name of a famous mail order? You know. Yeah, I did a, actually. I did. In it, fact, in your in sells a lot of yeah. metal stuff. So <laughs> uh, in Europe, uh, I go by Ellison Music Production, okay. which is what EMP is. It's an acronym for Ellison Music okay. Production. So yeah, over here on any of the albums, you'll notice it has the Ellison Music Production logo, not an EMP. Okay. Yeah, because you don't want any <laughs> That's problems. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you you've always been very active and very inspired as an artist. Uh, but, of course, you are mainly known as the bassist of Megadeth. Mm. Um, achieving a position like that, playing, you know, in one of the most important bands <clears throat> in metal mm. is like living a dream. Yeah. But can that be at the same time limitating some way for somebody like you, which has a lot of, you know, stuff going on? Yeah, well, you know, here's... Yeah, the answer is yes. <laughs> um, but, you know, I think that we've we found ways to do that. You know, I, um, uh, you know, 2002, Megadeth disbanded. Um, Dave had to step away from it. He called me up and that was, you know, we, we didn't dissolve our, you know, sort of business interests. Sure. But, but it was a, a moment where, you know, he publicly stated. A very intense moment. It was. It was a very <laughs> intense moment. And again, when you have a big band, a big company, all the business that goes around it. But, you know, we just kind of let it lie dormant. And then, you know, Dave obviously wanted to start working again. At that point, I was busy. I, was, I actually was, I was already involved in some other things. I was doing some I was uh, doing some artist relations for PV. I had a couple of other little music projects. And, and I was very realistic about the music projects. I mean, again, they were just for fun more than anything. But, you know, as, as you know, we went our separate ways for a few years. And then... Um, I think what happened for me is I, I I did fall back in love again with just the fun of getting in the room with some guys to just make some music with no real expectation of Loud where music. Yeah, just again <laughs> walking in, meeting people, playing, recording, yeah. writing, and just sort of just sort of being in the moment and letting things happen, you yeah. know. And I think when I came back to you know to, to play with Dave again in 2010 and you know be part of Megadeth again, I was a a, a much better bass player. I think I had a lot more experiences doing some other things away from Megadeth that I think brought, I think that it only helped Megadeth quite okay. honestly. And it, it brought me, it helped me grow up a little bit on my own because I think what happens is, you know, inside these bands, there's, there's always a, a role that everybody gets and they define themselves very early on. And sometimes those roles are set upon you. Mm -hmm. And then you grow as a person, but you can't grow outside of that right, role, right? Right, right. And it, and it can be very frustrating. You're people kind of trapped in yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> people either do solo projects, they leave the band, yeah. the band breaks up. And and that's unfortunate when that happens, because then it sort of dismantles a whole body of life's work, you know? Yeah. And so I think in, in you know, what, what I've done, and Bass Story is probably an example of it too, which is how... And look, I, I'm I know everything's within Megadeth. I'm I'm proud of that. I'm I'm a founding member of the group. I was yeah. there when it started, so I'm very yeah. proud of that. I'm not I don't ever want that to change again. That's that's a, a something I'm excessively passionate about as well. Um yet when we shut down for a year, two years and you know, work on other things and an album or even take a little bit of a breather, you know, the phone rings for me to go out and do something and play or write a book or be part of something, I do it because you know, that's also part of my own life. Right. And I think that I've been very diligent and very careful about doing things that don't ever take away from Megadeth, but I think, if anything, only add to it and make it more interesting and make it bigger and and, and, and help contribute to it. Um, so you take and leave the best of both worlds. I do. I really <laughs> do. And I, I'm very, I think I'm very fortunate and I've got a good team of people around me to help kind of guide me with that yeah you know so. um because they themselves are grew up on megadeth so they get the importance and the relevance right. of it and uh so it's you know it's never as something to be <coughs> excuse me to be distracting only something to be attracting you know to bring it together so as you said you've been in megadeth since day one mm -hmm. or am i say day zero yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. okay but you've always <coughs> been junior <laughs> since you share yeah. the same name with the boss 
Mustaine. So what else do you think you have much in common with Mr. Mustaine? With they, Apart well, from the name. <laughs> yeah, well, two names. We were both baptized Lutheran, so I guess there's that. Okay. Uh, you know, it's funny. Um, <laughs> you know, Dave, in some ways, we, we publicly appear to have different personalities. In a lot of ways, we're very much the same, you know. We both want the same thing. Sometimes we take a little bit of a different course to get there. But, you know, I, I've always <laughs> said I, 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 you know, defer to Dave when making the ultimate kind of executive decisions with Megadeth. You know, we're lucky we have a great leader like Dave. Um, he's obviously very opinionated. He's very outspoken. And, but I tell you what, when I'm on that stage, I'm always glad I'm on his team. Oh, because, right. I mean, he can handle anything on that stage. And it's and that that's went from the very beginning. And, and, I mean, I just can't sing his praises enough. He's, he's an incredible leader for the band. And how did you leave uh, the rivalry with Metallica? Uh, and is it true that you were considered twice to be their bassist, but it never happened? Yeah, I mean, there was, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. The, when Jason had left, you know, there was a, a phone call made over to our side, you know, about, you know, I was, I guess, on a short list. I never did get a call. And it's funny, I actually sat down for the first time and learned, kind of went and dug deep as a musician into some Metallica songs. Because I'm a, I'm a Metallica fan. I, 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 right. I especially the early records, I, I love them. And, uh, And they're our friends, and we. And you could tell Dave that you are a Metallica fan. Yeah, I mean, yeah of course, since, of course. Since you know the early yeah, days. Yeah, of course. Okay, and okay. it's funny, you know. I mean, I, I I always go back to my Metallica that I was introduced to was pre Kill 'Em All, was the No Life Till Leather. Okay. Uh, Metallica, which is what Dave had played me when I first right. met him, because because I met him again in June '83. I don't think Kill 'Em All came out till what maybe August or something. I think later. Yeah. Something. Yeah, it was oh, a yeah. couple months later. So um, I just remember listening to the Mechanics and Phantom Lord and hit the lights all that stuff off of that no life till leather demo yeah. uh, which had a different bass player ron mcgovney mm -hmm. um who i love he's a great <laughs> bass player he played with a pick and he had i play his bass line on mechanics i play the, the way he played it on on uh, the no life till leather uh <laughs> demo so you know i have kind of even a different experience you know with metallica but as we've gotten to know them and Um, you know, they're, they're, I, I, I love their band, you know, and they, I mean, I just look at them too, even just as a musician. I mean, man, the, the doors they broke down and the things they accomplished. I mean, they're with not only great songs, but as they're just as a team and their, their organization. I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that a metal band could be as big as you too. I yeah. mean, because that's how big they are. They're that massive. Right. And that's, I mean, as brothers in our genre, and I guess, By default, playing with Dave, I'm now a branch off of that tree, that family tree. <laughs> you know, I mean, what an honor, you know, to be to be even, you know, part of that and to be part of the genre and everything that, that we've done. And I mean, the big four, I think, was the wow. was that the big was, celebration yeah. of that. And that was very cool and of them. And there was a great family feeling in that there, show. There really you know? was. You know, yes, it's, it's so. funny. It was, it, I look at it, it's like, kind of like we were sort of all fighting our way up the hill <laughs> in our early career. And then we all got to the top of the hill. We got to enjoy the view and, you know, yeah. and... and have our successes, and then all these years later, we could come together as the big four, as, as, as brothers, and sort right. of share war stories. And, <laughs> and um, you know, the truth of it is, inside of all of our bands, we're all just the same. I mean, we really are, you know. Um, despite the platinum records and accolades and that stuff, the truth of it is, inside every band, we're all just the same. We, we really are. There's so many similarities between all of us. You started playing bass with fingers, <clears throat> then evolving with the pick. Mm -hmm. um, is it, you know, a popular belief that true bass players only play using fingers? And also, you know, there's another popular um, belief that bass players are only, I wish I could, but I can't, guitarists. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which is your point of view on all that? Well, first of all, <laughs> you know, would you, what would you say to Paul McCartney about the pick? Hmm. I mean, he's probably the That's most iconic, <laughs> top of the heap bass player ever, and yeah. he plays with a pick. You know, so. he's all. I, what I've also noticed is that a lot of bass players who play with a pick are also songwriters because we also play guitar. Okay. And I say we because that's me. And I am very much a bass player first. I'm a guitar player second. And I'm a pretty damn good rhythm guitar player. I don't claim to be a lead guitar player. That's an mm -hmm. entirely other skill set. Okay. I'm a pretty good acoustic player. Um, and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a pretty good, you know, hard rock metal, you know, riff based, uh, rhythm guitar player and rhythm guitar playing has a multi I mean, look, you look at Brian Setzer, how yeah. he plays, how Malcolm Young, Malcolm Young. played, uh, you know, so rhythm Keith guitar Richards. playing, 
you know, we just look, we just lost Dick Dale, you yeah. know, the surf king. That's now there's a, a rhythm and a lead style. I don't play like that. You know what I mean? So music can't just be a broad category. We all start to kind of focus because of where our interests lie. You know, yeah. for me as a bass player, yeah, look, I learned how to play with the fingers. Because I got in bands and and I needed to be heard better. And I like and the music I liked was harder rock. Uh, it wasn't even metal yet. I hadn't discovered metal, but the harder stuff that I liked, you know, I watched like Tom Hamilton from okay. from from, uh, Aerosmith. from Aerosmith. Yeah, he played with the pick. Obviously, once in a while, Tom played with the pick, and certainly Gene Simmons. Yeah. you know, the first guy. <laughs> also, I was a big fan of this band, uh, Bachman Turner Overdrive. Yeah, and I noticed uh, Fred Turner, the bass player, he played with the pick once in a while. So I noticed guys that were kind of using both, and I realized, you know, there's a time to pick, there's a time to pluck. Sometimes some music, there's a time to slap and pop. And so I think as a bass player, you should be able to do all of it because, and especially if you're a sideman working musician and you're doing like pickup gigs, you really need to be able to do all of it if you're going to get hired. You didn't mention Lemmy. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> Lemmy was much later for me. But, okay. you, know, you know, here's the interesting thing about Lemmy. Um, we did a, when he passed, um, we were doing a, a short little tour with another group I have called Metal Allegiance. Okay. And it was in California. And he passed suddenly. And we were playing at the Whiskey we had okay. a show booked at the and the whiskey called and said hey would would you guys be a sort of house band to host a lemmy memorial we said of course like perfect band to do it you know yeah. we're all fans so i sat down and i really dug in and i played in my teen bands love me like a reptile and of course we all know ace of spades you know i've gone into the you know we are the road crew and all these these songs and i really started studying lemmy's playing and what i realized is he plays like an acoustic guitar player The way his swagger of how he picks, and we are the road crew. That's an interesting. And right, the way he plucks and the way he feels the rhythm is more akin to an acoustic guitar player. And then I kind of, I was like, God, you know, it would make sense. He's the songwriter. He he, his sound is pretty much carries the band, and he's also the singer. So he's kind of grooving. Around obviously drums, but he's grooving around the the melody and the the, yeah. the 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 lyrics that he's singing. So it gave me a whole different appreciation for you know Lemmy's simplicity, but also kind of some nuances of how he plays. Yeah. Played, yeah. So tonight we mentioned again your uh, bass storytelling in Milan, mm -hmm. bass story, right. um, and in Milan, okay, yep. Legend Club. But about 100 kilometers from here in Cremona, Marty Friedman is playing a gig as well. I heard, tonight. I heard, yeah. So what a tricky coincidence, I yeah. must say. Do you still see each other? Are you still good friends? <clears throat> we do, we do. And um, Marty and I, yeah, in fact, I just saw him when we played with, with Metal Allegiance uh, in January during yeah. the Winter NAMM show in, Holly, in uh, Anaheim, California. Yeah. Um, we played uh, at the House of Blues, Anaheim, And Marty was playing downstairs. Okay. And a mutual agent friend of ours, Andy, came up to see me, and and then yeah, let's go see Marty. So we went downstairs, and there's Marty. And uh, no, we've we've been Marty and I have have remained good friends, you know. Um, and uh, in fact, we played together. Uh, he 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 opened for Metal Allegiance, uh, or was on on a show with Metal Allegiance um, at Nam three years ago, I think. Mm -hmm. And so he came up and joined us, and we did an encore jam at the end and played together and stuff so it's uh yeah it's it's great i mean marty's an incredible player and you know there's a perfect example he had a desire to do something other than megadeth now you can either right fight your way out the door and have resentment and be angry or you just you let a brother go you know you you you'll kind of release him lovingly and you say you know what as a friend If you don't want to be here, if you want something else that you want to do, by all means, go explore. And, you know, look, we had to get another guitar player. We had to, you know, revamp the group. That part kind of sucks. Yeah. But at the same time, if, you know, in his case, he wanted to go explore some other stuff. And, you know, let, I think that's one of the worst things you can do as a human is to hold someone back from exploring a life that's calling them. Because that's also, I mean, you want to talk about religion and all yeah. this God stuff. I mean... I always say G-O-D, good orderly direction. There it is, you know? When, 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 when the power that be sort of leads you and pulls you towards something, yeah. as a friend, the best friend you could be is let them go. Let, you know, the old, uh, 
if you love something, set it free. You know yeah. what I mean? And if it's meant to return, it will. But otherwise, you know, that's the thing is sometimes we get so attached to these things. And we're not supposed to, you know. It's like he's the boss. Let him have his way. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the, the most classics, classic and loved metallic um, Megadeth, sorry, mm. lineup yeah. is of course with you, yeah. Dave, Marty, and Nick. Right. Uh, that's the collective imagination. Or that's the classic one. <clears throat> uh, do you perceive it the same way? Which is your feeling? You know, my favorite memories of that period was that we, for the first time, you know, in the beginning, it was me and Dave, similar age, similar musical interests. Um, Gar and Chris were older than us, came from a little bit of a different genre, for sure, a different genre, uh, even maybe a little bit of a different musical influence. Yeah. Um, so there was a little bit of a disparity between that. And I think when that lineup circled out we got chuck beeler and you know jeff young in the band you know chuck was was certainly a a, a rocker brother of ours um you know jeff great player was but it didn't all fit right you know um and then i think when we finally you know regrouped to do rust in peace yeah. what happened with that with marty and nick is is we felt like It was four guys who looked the same, we thought the same, we had similar interests. And I think that's what you can tell with that lineup, is 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 that there was similar common heartfelt bonds. You know, Rust in Peace and Countdown to Extinction are still considered, you know, huge yeah. masterpieces of yeah. trash metal and metal in general. So well, and like, you know, Rust in Peace was largely written, it was first me, Dave, and Chuck, then it was me, Dave, and Nick, pretty much wrote the whole, you know, put that record together. And then when Marty came in, you know, Marty got to really uh, have explosive solos. He didn't really get to compose much because the record was pretty much done. He came yeah. in to, you know, perform on the record. But when we got into doing Countdown, that was an album that really started to show the four of us collaborating. And I think that's what people love about that period is mm. there was a true collaboration. Yeah. Uh, with Megadeth, it it it's it was it was four guys really connected, really contributing, and really being part of a of a of a bigger common goal. Yeah. In 2013, you find it, you founded uh, Altitudes and Attitude with Frank Bello of Anthrax, right. um, and two months ago, finally, the debut album "Get It Out" arrived. Right. Um, are you? old time friends with Frank uh, or is that like you know a pure metal based connection uh, musical stuff how did it came about you know it's funny Frank and I have known each other for years mostly just kind of in passing backstage he and I didn't really become true buddies and really get to know each other until around 2010 11 we started doing these base clinics mm -hmm. and um that's when we became friends and that's when we really started to learn who we are you know and we're different guys at now than we were obviously 25 30 years ago yes, you know uh, we're grown-ups we have families we've had you know had some pretty good careers But, you know, we've also had our struggles and we've had our difficulties and, you know, we've like real life stuff, you know, like everybody has. And I think that's what you hear coming out on the Get It Out record. There's a whole other side to Frank I didn't even know existed. I mean, <laughs> I always saw him as this like happy guy, you know, um, and and he is generally. But, you know, he's he's I, I, I could feel his yearning for a voice to be heard, you know, and I in a lot of ways I wanted to champion Uh, an outlet for Frank to get that out. Because mm. again, I'd seen it with Marty. I'd seen it with other band members that I've been in a group with. Um, and I said, listen, Frank, you know, and even again, in his case, he's, you know, Charlie Benanti is his uncle. So it's, he's got family and they're Italian. <laughs> yes. So, I mean, it's like real Italian stuff in there. Um, uh, so it's, um, you know, I ch when I heard Frank's songs, I'm like, I mean, my whole thing was like, let's just write some tracks for a bass clinic, mm -hmm. you know. And then it turned into real songs, and then it turned into like, you know, Frank is my friend, and and I really, I'm pretty good at starting things and putting things together okay. and building bands and record companies, and I'm pretty good at that. That's one of my gifts in this life. So I was like, you know what, let's put something together. Let's really build something here that we can have that really provides an outlet for both of us to do in a way that doesn't get in the way of Anthrax and Megadeth. It's mm -hmm. always respectful for our, for our, our home teams, but yet... We can enjoy it over here. And when we step out for a season to do it, it's fun. We can have the brother, you know, brotherhood. 
um, we can celebrate and kind of point to each other and say, mm-hmm. wow, check out what Frank did. Hey, check out what David did. Um, yeah. How did you work on it? I mean, you, you can have two guitar players in a band, but two <clears throat> bases together. Two bases <laughs> Well, you know, it's How interesting. did you share parts? And we, the... we both wrote, for the most part, I mean, there's one song, Leviathan, that I wrote on bass, but for the most part, we wrote it all on guitar. Okay, um, and we, so... got, we came together as guitar players. That mm-hmm. was what really brought A&A together, as okay. guitars and lyrics and, and Frank singing. Um, and, you know, that's that's the heart and soul of A&A. It, it's, as much as it, we, it, our friendship was born out of bass clinics, the, the heart of A&A is not really a base project at all okay now the the rhythm section of your dreams is <clears throat> there any drummer in rock history you wish you could play with or a bassist that you are ma- admire in particular well look if for an afternoon i could just be part of Geddy Lee and Neil Peart, you know, okay. as, as, as the rhythm section would be awesome. I don't know what I could possibly contribute to that because they're amazing. <laughs> Probably be my fan moment more than anything. But, um, you know, I love Bob Daisley as a bass player. I mean, just to, you know, Max Norman, who made Megadeth Records, he talks about, uh, you know, making Blizzard of Oz and Diary of a Madman. In fact, Max is working on a, a book mm-hmm. with my friend Tom right now, um, which I encouraged him to do. I said, Max, you really need to write a book. You made some records that are just masterpieces, the Ozzy records, the Megadeth records. I said, you you should write about this stuff, you know? Um, so uh, he's working on that. But, um, you know, there's, I mean, as far as a bass player, I mean, drummers, you know, I've, God, I've been fortunate to work with a ton of great ones, and I p- still play with a bunch. I mean, in Metal Legions, I play with Mike Bornoy, sometimes Charlie Benante, yeah. John Tapesta, <laughs> Mickey D has sat in. I mean, I get to, you know, that's the thing, kind of the beauty of Metal Legions is it's this fun, we're all just buddies. You yeah. know, people call it an all-star band, and maybe it is to the outside world, but internally, we're all just a bunch, we're all buddies. We're all just friends in the campus, and we get together, and we call each other up, hey, you want to, you know, go out and jam with on this thing and and so i i kind of think probably in metal legions i get to i get to have kind of this other outlet where i get to play with all these super amazing great friends of mine and 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 have musical moments with them um so i don't know i'm pretty satisfied quite honestly among all the side projects that you've done mm-hmm. which are a lot uh which is the one you consider a real goal achieved You know, I think every one of them is in a certain way. You know, I think I think all of them are. They again, Metal Legions, quite honestly, was just you know, there's a moment that happened uh, on motorboat, and it was actually it actually kind of already started with Metal Masters, which even that was bo- born out of me and Frank's bass clinics because mm-hmm. we brought in uh, um, Charlie Benante and Mike Portnoy, yeah. and then you know, two bass players, two drummers. And Charlie's an amazing guitar player. Oh, God, he's great. So, so he's, yeah. Um, then we needed a singer, so we called in some singers. And then that's kind of how Metal Allegiance was born, was out of those uh, um, moments. Yeah. And But I think, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, what me and Frank are doing is is great. It's because it, it's not a metal thing. It's, mm-hmm. it's more of just a, a, a cool rock It's almost not even hard rock at times. It's just rock, and it, I just I love it. It's it's a it's. Frank and I grew up on the same stuff out in the '70s when we were young kids, and and I think you know Cheap Trick, Kiss, and you know all this kind of yeah. stuff. And you hear a lot of those influences in what we're doing there. Winning a Grammy uh, is a life changing experience mm-hmm. for a musician. But how was it for you? It it is life changing. You know, it, it's been great to be nominated. We were nominated 12 times and finally won. And I will say that winning is, it does change. Um, you know, I mean, look, it's the first time you'll ever see, you know, me and Dave and Kiko and Dirk. The only time you'll see Megadeth's face next to Beyonce, you know, on the, <laughs> on the Grammy.com website, you know. But, you know, the truth of it is, is the Grammys were thrilled for us. They were so excited because they know the history of how many times we've been nominated. Yeah. And obviously the metal category inside the Grammys has always been sort of a bone of contention. And they're very aware of it, you know. But they, I got to say, to their credit, you know, they've really they've called on a lot of us in the metal community to be on the voting committees to help make sure that we don't have a Metallica Jethro Tull moment, you know, <laughs> that the right songs are in the right category right. and that the right people. I mean, I think they've been kind of trying to figure it out, too. It's, you know, metal is a very... 
it's a very demanding and very discerning category, you know. And boy, if you slide slightly to the left or right of it, fans cry foul. So, um, and I think that the Recording Academy have really they're they're doing their part, you know, to make sure that 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 doesn't happen again. Those kind of blunders, but. Um, you know, and it, we've, we're, a, we're part of them with my, my David Ellison, my Youth Music Foundation. We're part of the Grammy Music Education Coalition. So just as much as winning, as much as that's a nice accolade, just as much it's, it's about the opportunities that come out of that and seeking to explore and become part of those opportunities that, that, that spin out of being a Grammy winner. Because to just sit in a they want a Grammy, I mean, that's kind of self-serving. So to me, it's more about... You've been given this opportunity and you've been given this accolade. What can I do with that to continue to give back? You know, yeah. because it's it's always about helping the next generation and helping other people. It's never just about serving yourself. Last question. Mm -hmm. They say rock is dead. Mm -hmm. Somebody says that. Yeah, somebody says that. What's the future of metal music as we love it, yeah. in your opinion? Well, it's never dead. And again, for anyone who says rock and rock is dead, obviously doesn't play rock anymore. Um, <laughs> and rock's a pretty wide category, you know. Um, <clears throat> I know a couple people have said that, and... and uh, you know, rock gave them their life. <laughs> so I don't... Yeah. And I, so and look, Gene Simmons well, said that. Well, look, I, in particular, it's funny, you know, you think about him and, and, you know, what he, I think he was referring to, I don't know, is probably about the record industry with rock music. And, yeah. and to that degree, you know, that statement is partially a true statement, you know, that, that when you look at the numbers of how many records it sells and et cetera, et cetera, yeah, as a business, a lot of that in the record industry is... is, is tiny compared to what it used to be fortunately you know rock doesn't just only you know rely on record sales um and you know we can go out i mean look kiss is a perfect example i mean every show they're playing right now is sold out right. it, they're as they're as big as they've ever been right now and they're a rock band so um while the industry of selling records may not support it the industry of going out to see the concerts um buy the t-shirt hang out with other KISS fans or other other rock and metal fans. You can't replicate that. The internet, as much as it may have changed um, and almost destroyed the record business, it can't replicate being in a room. Even you and me, we could be on the phone doing this interview. It's not the same when I'm sitting right. in Arizona and you're in Milano <laughs> yeah. and the phone line's crackling right. and we probably get cut off. We got to call each You cannot see <clears throat> yeah, it in your eyes. You it's know. not the same, man. So, <laughs> you know, the internet does a lot of great things, but it doesn't ever replace this moment of just people being in the same room to the energy and just that and that's what a concert really is and yeah. i think with metal that's the thing we like it's the community it's the beer you drink it's the freaking cigarette you smoke it's the band that's on the stage it's the t-shirt we have on <laughs> it's all it's all part of that and that that that's you can't nail it down to one thing it's all of it combined that's yeah. what metal really is okay so everybody listening on facebook tonight David Allison is bass storing. <laughs> okay, he's playing. It's a new word, bass storing. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's playing and actually storytelling in yeah. Milan at Legend Club. Tickets are still available, so go there. Which is your ultimate invitation to the people to come tonight? <sighs> I think Instead you'd... of staying home in front of the TV <laughs> on the sofa, you know. <laughs> yes, come out to be part of it. You know, I know it's a week night, it's a school night. Yeah. Everybody's got to work tomorrow. We won't keep you out all night. But yeah, it's definitely a fun, special, unique event. No two base stories are the same. Mm -hmm. We have some special guests that come oh, up yeah. and jam. And uh, I've got some good friends here in town that are going to come up and play. And uh, so it's, yeah, it's it come out for a unique event. And you're not going to regret it. I don't think so. I don't. I, I don't. I don't think you will. I think it's a. It's a. It's a special once in a lifetime one-off event. Yeah. Thanks, David, for your time Welcome. and these long interviews. It's been a pleasure for me. And you. see you soon back in Italy, hopefully. Yeah, yeah the new album. We'll be back with Megadeth. Yeah. Thank you. See ya. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao, everybody. Ciao. <laughs> cool.